Welcome, everybody. I'm Teresa Torres. And I'm Hope Gurion. We're going to discuss today what it looks like to be an empowered product team, and especially for leaders, how to hold empowered product teams accountable um, to their outcomes. This is a challenge that comes up a lot in our work. And I'm going to talk with Hope about it in particular because she does both um, leadership coaching. So she gets to work with leaders on this on a regular basis. And she also teaches our defining outcomes class. So she gets to see it from the individual contributor side as well. So she's got a pretty well-rounded perspective. Uh, to kick us off, Hope, do you want to just say a little bit about what's an empowered product team and why it's becoming a more common concept? Yeah, sure. I'd have to be happy to. Uh, when I think about empowered product teams, I kind of feel like it's on this spectrum of where teams are. And there's probably multiple points on the spectrum that I'm going to miss, but like there's the, um, you know, sort of delivery team, feature team, the one that's I wouldn't particularly say is empowered, has sort of low uh, discretion over what they work on. And maybe at the opposite end of that spectrum might be a completely autonomous product team. Sometimes certain teams or companies might aspire to truly autonomous teams, but I feel like more often than not, and I don't know if it's maybe slightly skewed to this end of the spectrum, there's this concept of an empowered product team. And when I think about that, this is a team that has clarity of purpose. They have a clear measure of success that is an outcome that they're working towards, usually over some you know, longer period of time, not like this week, it's this outcome and next week, it's that outcome. And they really are the ones deciding how to spend their time. So they're not totally autonomous and that they can do whatever they want, but they're working towards something that the company, the leadership has agreed on is incredibly important. It's a measure of success. So they're an outcome oriented team, but they do have quite a bit of discretion about how they decide how to spend their time to be able to create that outcome, that measure of success. Yeah, that's great. Let's, I want to kind of hit highlight some of the things that you said. So I think traditionally product teams have been feature teams where stakeholders are dictating, build these specific solutions, and the team goes off and builds those things. And that's where we get kind of traditional roadmaps where they have a list of features to deliver by a fixed deadline. And then we've sort of started to look at, let's move more towards giving those teams more decision-making power. In theory, they're closest to the customer if they're doing good discovery work. Um, and also it just gives us scale, like a leader can't define what 40 teams should do. Um, but I love your distinction between autonomous teams and empowered teams, because I think too many people interpret this as oh, we get to work on whatever we want. And if somebody outside of our team is telling us anything, then we're no longer autonomous. Do you want to just um, touch on that key difference between empowered and uh, autonomous a little bit? For me, it implies that they are really a, a sort of isolated, siloed from what the rest of the organization wants, expects, needs. An empowered product team should have a lot of discretion about how they spend their time and what they work on and should have a way that their team's decision making and delivery choices are evaluated in terms of their contribution to the company by solving the needs of the customers they most need to serve. But that doesn't necessarily mean that 100% of their time and attention is always going to go to that outcome. There sometimes there's high integrity, you know, commitments. There may be, depending on the org structure design, there may be some inter-team dependencies. There could be a security risk or threat that uh, the team is going to have to remedy or mitigate in some way. So it's not that these teams are totally autonomous doing whatever they want, but they they recognize their contribution to the company's uh, you know, value streams, and they have high amounts of decision-making power to decide what they work on, but they're not completely um, siloed from any of the expectations of the organization. Yeah, this is, I think you're hitting on a key point, which is the expectations of the organization. And some of that is set through the outcome, right? Mm -hmm. We're going to say, look, you do have, you are empowered to make decisions as long as whatever you do has this impact that will measure with this outcome. But I think what I'm hearing in your response, there's more to it than that. And I think Marty Kagan would talk about it as 
um, leaders are setting the strategic context, and then the empowered team is reaching their outcome in a way that's consistent with that strategic context. Yes. And that st strategic context could be things like the product vision, any strategic objectives that are sort of relevant in the organization at that moment in time. And so then that kind of gives us this middle ground between we want to push decision making down, we want to um, have scale by letting our teams make more of the decisions, um, and actually have, I think Marty talks about missionaries versus mercenaries, have more missionaries rather than mercenaries. Um, but it's not really just go do whatever you want whenever you feel like it. Yes. Yeah. And I have worked with a lot of companies that they thought that was the ideal. And then they yeah. kind of moved to that. And all of a sudden the pendulum swings right back. So that's why I mentioned it's on a spectrum. Um, and even even teams who who are on a mission and have an outcome that they're working towards, you know, they uh, they may not spend a hundred percent of their time working towards that outcome. And I think some for some teams that can be difficult to navigate because they're either missing the strategic context that helps them understand why they can't necessarily spend a hundred percent of their time towards that outcome, or they feel like they're becoming a feature team if they don't spend a hundred percent of their time working towards the outcome. So I think that's something that every product team has to navigate and, and the product leader in that organization has to help their teams recognize that it's being an empowered product team means that you to to remain an empowered product team all means delivering value to the company by solving the needs of customers, but maybe not a hundred percent of the time. Yeah, there's still sort of the keep the lights on work. Yep. There's still, and it, this is something we hear a lot from teams, right? Where they feel like it has to be all or nothing. And I think what we see is it's never all or nothing, right? Right. So like you might have your outcome, you're going to spend a good chunk of your time working towards that outcome. There will be times where your leaders are still going to say, no, we need this solution. Maybe it's because of a regulation or some compliance issue. Maybe it's just a really strategic thing that your leaders have already decided we're doing this. Mm -hmm. um, and I think people think, oh, that means we're no longer empowered. Yeah. Whereas I like this idea of like, it is a spectrum. It may not be 100% of your time. There's some flexibility here. We want to push decision making down, but we also want to make sure we're staying aligned as a company and that everybody's working together. That's, that's a great way to summarize it. What? Okay. So let's, so I can see in the old world where I managed my product teams by a fixed roadmap with features and release dates, I could evaluate their effectiveness by just asking, did they build what we asked them to? And then did, did they deliver it on time? And of course I can look at on budget or whatever. In this new world where it's a little messier, you've got an outcome, you've got some strategic context, you're spending some chunk of your time just doing whatever it takes to reach that. How are we holding those teams accountable? For me, what I found to be most effective was uh, something I've called discovery demos. They don't have to be long. They don't have to be very formal, right? All we're trying to do is see what has the team learned lately that is helping them advance progress towards their outcome. And this could be in the structure of an opportunity solution tree really at any level. If we've set the outcome if this is an outcome that the team has been working towards for a long time, we might zoom right into an opportunity that they're working on solving and some assumption tests that they're doing. That might be the right moment that they're focused on. If this is a brand new outcome for a team, then in those first few discovery demos, it might be that we're looking at what opportunities have they discovered or how are they sizing those opportunities? So they're, look, what each team focuses on in those discovery demos is going to be very specific to where that team is in relation to their outcome, how much they've learned, how much they've delivered in the past towards that outcome, how impactful that's been. But the way that I would structure these is I would do them every two weeks you could do it as a different cadence, but I did them every two weeks, discovery delivery demos, and the team was either demoing, this is what we've learned lately. They they start with the why, this is the outcome we're working towards. This is what we've done lately and what we've learned from it. Here's what we're doing next. And it wasn't just for my benefit. It was for all the other teams. And again, every company could do this differently. It could be that you're inviting other stakeholders, other leaders to come in. But for the most part, I found that it was really the other 
members of the product and design engineering organization who participate because they also learn from what each other are doing and they can coach and offer suggestions and help the other team members expedite their progress. So it just had this really nice um, benefit of not only sharing progress, but expediting progress amongst the different teams towards their outcomes. So for me, that is a very helpful ritual to replace the, what did you deliver? And are there any blockers next? Yeah. Yeah. I've seen this work really well in several different companies where, and again, it's not a deep dive. It's get all the teams together, however many there are. And I know for larger companies, maybe they're doing this in the guild or tribe or whatever the right Spotify model term is, right? It doesn't have to be every product team in your company. It can be tailored based on the group that's relevant, but it's cross cross product team sharing of take a chunk of time every two weeks, every three weeks, every four weeks, whatever the right cadence is. Here's what we learned. Um, What I love about this is it sets the norm that this is how we work. Discovery and learning is an important part of what we do here. Um, And then I've also seen a lot of really effective like cross learning and serendipity and just other teams sparking ideas from hearing about what other teams are learning. Um, So, okay, so we've got a bunch of teams, they're tasked with outcomes. We're meeting every two weeks, we're sharing what we're learning. Um, The other thing I love about this is it's really consistent with an idea um, Christina Watke wrote about in Radical Focus, where she has this like one page template her teams fill out. Here's our outcome, here's what we're focused, or our OKR, here's the progress we're made, here's our confidence Mm -hmm. in it. So many teams like set an outcome and then don't revisit it till the very end of the quarter. Right. This kind of keeps it ever present as well. Um, So so we've got a bunch of teams. They've got outcomes. They're meeting every two weeks, sharing their um, discovery demos. Mm -hmm. Is there anything else that they're doing or that the leader is doing to hold the team accountable? We're seeing progress towards the outcome so that they are ready by the end of the quarter, which goes with another form of accountability to share what typically is in a product review. Like here's how much progress we made towards the outcome. Here's what we learned. Here's what we're going to do next, but it's more at that quarter view. Yeah. So sort of by every other week check-ins on what we learned, it's sort of like a sprint retrospective, but discovery Mm -hmm. focused. Mm -hmm. And then there's sort of this quarterly review of let's take a step back across the quarter. What do we learn about the opportunity space? How much impact do we have on our outcome? What does that mean for what we might do next quarter? Um, What I love about this is it kind of matches what we do in our coaching when we're working with teams, right? We meet with them every week. Um, And so we can get a view of like, are they making as much progress as we would expect? Um, We've, I know I've seen teams sort of spin their wheels and not make progress. What um, have you seen works effectively when a team, um, maybe it's just clear from their demos that they're not learning what they should be or they're, you know, we've all been in that situation where experiment after experiment just fails or um, we're not getting a rich opportunity space. Um, what are your tips for helping a team get back on track? If you're not making progress, and this is why those bi-weekly discovery demos become so helpful because you're not seeing it for the first time at the end of the quarter and then the end of the next quarter. You're seeing this pattern of, huh, they're not making as much progress. Um, sometimes it's you know, it's in discovery. It's the opportunity that they've chosen or the data they've chosen or who they chose to interview or how they structured that assumption test. But if you're seeing how they're approaching learning it, usually we can correct that before they make the mistake. Sometimes they have a, a blind spot that only other members of the team see. And this is why like, I like it as a leader. It's not just on me, this other people on the team can see it. But when you have to present your results and what you've learned every week, if you aren't making progress over time, it it does become uncomfortable. Like there, we end up having a more frank conversation. Usually we do that outside of these public forums so that we can really root cause it and get to like a five whys or something else that helps us figure out why is this, It maybe it's the wrong outcome. And we actually have given them an outcome that they can't make progress towards, or maybe there's something else that they're being tasked with or spending time on. So I, it's hard for me to say all the things to do to diagnose when a team isn't making progress, but the more that you're having these rituals, the more you and other members can help spot 
why the team isn't making progress and offer suggestions to help them succeed. Yeah. You know what I love about this is it's really consistent with this ethos of like working out loud and showing your work. Um, I think it's so easy, especially for leaders that are managing a lot of teams, that when a team isn't making progress towards their outcome to conclude, it's a performance issue. And sometimes it's a performance issue, but I think most of the time it's that when we're learning, when we're in learning mode, we're not always going to learn what we expect. So it could be we have the wrong outcome. It could be we're not working on the most important opportunity. It could be our value proposition, our strategy isn't resonating with the with the t- customer segment. Um, and I think one of the things that's hardest to do in discovery is to have um, real intellectual honesty about the work that we're doing and how we interpret our results. And I think doing this in a shared forum helps us rely on our teammates, not our immediate trio mates, but like our broader product team and engineering and design teams to help hold us accountable to that intellectual honesty. Because if I go two or three, two week periods in a row where I'm not making progress, I'm going to hope one of my colleagues points that out because I might have a blind spot to it, right? I want somebody to call me out and say, hey, this has been six weeks. So it looks like you're spinning your wheels. Do you need to take a step back? Mm-hmm. And I think that requires a culture that focuses on learning and not performing. Um, and the irony is, I think when we have a learning culture, we do perform, but a performing culture does not always learn to perform, l- result in performing and it rarely results in learning. Right. Um, yes. So I love this um, model of let's, it's not just the trio that's a team, it's the whole broader product design and engineering organizations that is the team responsible for holding that accountability. Yeah. And I've had that experience where it, it, in in one particular instance, I'm remembering, um, it was actually something that the team was trying to get into a live data prototype to run an experiment. And they were delayed on being able to get this experiment out. And it was a, it was a junior, you know, engineering lead on the team who needed coaching from other engineering leaders who had seen that challenge before and they had remedied it, remedied it. And so again, this is why it it being a cross-functional experience, because sometimes it's something in discovery, sometimes it's something in delivery. And when you have those experienced perspectives in the room, again, it's just about expediting progress towards that outcome. And you can, uh, if that's the mindset of everybody in the room, then it really becomes uh, a, even more of a team sport to make progress on those outcomes. Okay, so I've heard a couple things. Like I wanna, I wanna end with some like really actionable guidelines for leaders. So I know we've talked about this every other week demo, the sort of quarterly review. Um, that's a potential solution. Like people, leaders yeah. could take that and implement that in their organization. But we know there's not there's not one right way to do this. Yep. So do you want to generalize a little bit? If you were going to give a leader, you've probably done this in your coaching many times. If you're going to give you a leader, like a, a leader, some just guiding principles for how would you implement, um, you might have to adapt the tactics for your own organization, but what are the sort of guiding principles to keep in mind um, as they try to do this in their own organization? A lot of leaders struggle to set and agree on outcomes with their teams because they're not sure it's the right outcome for their team to be focused on. And they're worried about this is our measure of success. And maybe it's not the right one. Like focus on teams belief in the outcome over perfection in that outcome. So again, it starts with having an outcome defined for your teams. And as you pointed out, we've got lots of resources to help people with good product outcomes for their product teams. Um, the, The second is when you're trying to assess progress, you wanna make sure that the team is willing feels comfortable sharing both what is working for them and what has been challenging for them, right? If you can't get that level of honesty, then you can't troubleshoot that as a leader and other members of your product and design engineering organization aren't going to be able to offer really actionable advice. So if people, like you want to make sure that there isn't this bias towards, we want our teams to always look good in case somebody else is looking in, uh, you know, the CEO or somebody else is looking in. So you really want to make sure you've got that sort of psychological safety for your teams. And again, a culture that values, like, let's just look at the progress we're making for what it is 
and see if there's ways that we can make more progress. Um, the third would be making sure that people feel accountability to their mission, as opposed to feelings of accountability to their boss. Like to me, that's the other thing that I, I don't think results in a healthy type of accountability. Like if there's meaning in that mission, the team had a say in what their outcome was and they feel like, and they're the ones making the decisions, like let them measure how much progress they're making towards that mission, as opposed to feeling like, well, I, I have to do this because I want to please my boss or make my boss look good or not be reprimanded by my boss. So, and then, and then finally, this is a little bit related to looking good, like focus on substance, like who cares what those biweekly demos look like, like don't have a lot of overhead and design and presentation, like focus on substance over style, because again, we want to get to the meat of what the teams are learning, and what might be standing in the way of them making progress towards their outcomes, so we can help them get there faster. That last one really resonates with me. I know in my book, I tried to focus on how do we use the same visuals we're creating to stay aligned as a team to present to our stakeholders? Because the mm -hmm. last thing we want is to have our teams lose a day creating slide decks. Yes. Right? That's not very valuable. Um, I also love your comment about who you invite to this meeting is going to have a really big impact on the culture of the meeting. So if your CEOs in the room, are people going to feel comfortable saying they didn't learn, like they've kind of flailed for the last two weeks because they're having a problem with something. Um, whereas that's really what we want. So we yeah. want them to feel comfortable showing how the sausage is made, like what went well, what didn't go well, how do we course correct as needed? Um, okay. So it sounds like we've got some really great, like you're a leader, you want to do this. You might have to experiment with the cadence, who you invite, how many teams, um, but really the key principles here are make sure it's about the learning and not performing. Make sure that you're not having them create hours and hours, spend hours and hours on their presentation. Um, some of these ethos are really similar to what we see with sprint demos. It's the same mm -hmm. idea, right? Just mm -hmm. show your work. This yep. isn't a big ta-da. Um, okay. Let's say I want to learn more. Like I'm inspired. Um, this all sounds great. Where is there somewhere I can find some ex more examples or other models that are similar to this? Um, you already mentioned that the Christina Waterkey's radical focus book, and she has a more you know Monday commitments, Friday wins type of a template that she does, which is more of a written uh, way of of assessing the team's progress. Um, there's a great uh, post from Reforge around operating rituals, which again show and tell, show your work. And again, with all the continuous discovery habits, artifacts, and the opportunity solution tree and assumption test, there's lots of ways that teams can show their work without perfect slide decks. Um, and then also I uh, have an episode from the Fearless Product Leadership Podcast where I ask product leaders, like, what do you do to create accountability for product teams? So those are some of the resources that we can share uh, with everybody. Yeah. And I'll add to that list, uh, my business is software talk where, um, oh, perfect. one of the things that I include in that is just some questions leaders can ask their teams, right. To help stay out of this. Like we tend to, when things go wrong, we want to jump back into outputs, right? So it just gives you some questions you can ask so that you're not jumping back to what's delivered when. Yes. Um, and what I love about your, your, the sort of uh, PDF that you created about those questions is as a, a leader or for other leaders, depending on where the teams are in terms of, are they in the opportunity space or in the solution space or the outcome, those questions can help really make sure that they're being the most helpful without being overly directive. Exactly. And it's such a hard balance. I think even at the end of that talk, I shared a story about how I even struggled this, with this with the people that I work with. Um, so it, we know this stuff is not easy. Um, and so I think that's a good place to end is just to remember that you're not going to be perfect at this. It's really about how do you get a little bit better next week than you were last week and be really nice to yourselves because leading teams and being accountable for their outcomes is hard. 